Welcome to the Philosophy of the Cosmic Dance. Most of you are doing the turning training, and this is going to be your group to process your experience of what goes on, and also to learn the knowledge that lies behind the Mevlevi turning tradition. And in your classes, you're, as you've discovered, you're not allowed to speak. So this is your chance to speak. And for those of you who are not doing the turning training, this is group acts as like an introduction to the non-dual philosophies that underlie the world's different mystical traditions. And for the turners, um, initially I'll just do some history. I'll tell you about this house and this society and how we come to have turning, dervish turning here. And then with the philosophy, it's devastatingly simple. It's so simple that you'll, you'll probably miss it, but you may not. It's so simple. Um, but understanding the basic philosophy that underlies the tradition will help you in your practice. And then later on in the term, I'll explain the symbolism behind the ceremony. And once you know the principles that underlie it, then um, you'll understand the symbolism very easily and it will add to your experience of the training and your experience when you turn. And with these meetings, it's a dialogue, so at any time interrupt me and ask any questions or disagree with me. Um, and also, I won't waffle on endlessly. When I feel we've had enough, then I'll, we can just end the meeting and go home. Because for those of you who have been on the training, it's, it can be quite a shock initially, and it's quite tiring. So you don't want to hang around too long. So different meetings will go on for different lengths of time. And theoretically, we'll go on up to Easter, <coughs> But again, if we cover all the knowledge and you feel you've had enough, then I'll, I'll stop before then. So it's really up to you and what you want. And also I've got a rough meeting plan, but again, according to your interest and what you want to hear and your questions, meetings might take a completely different form. So nothing's really fixed in that way. But the only bit which is definitely fixed is I will at some point explain the symbolism that lies behind the ceremony. First of all, I'll just give you a bit of history about this house and the society that lives here. <coughs> and the work which happens in this house was started by a Russian philosopher and writer called P. D. Uspensky. And he used this as his headquarters in London back in the 1930s and he'd always been interested in the study of consciousness and by consciousness he meant the awareness that lies behind our thoughts and our feelings and our desires so that was what he meant by consciousness it's just your basic sense of amnes your basic sense of identity and so he sort of set up a society here for the study of consciousness. And he'd written some quite sort of um, intelligent books, I think. And he also had a teacher who was a, a Greek, a Russian Greek called G.I. Gurdjieff. And at a certain point, Uspensky separated from Gurdjieff and carried on independently. And during his lifetime, he never really found what he was looking for, because what he was interested in was direct um, experience of consciousness and direct access to consciousness. And so he left it to his followers to carry on his work. And he died in 1947, and one of his followers took over from him, and he was a man called Dr. Francis Rolls, and he was also, Dr. Rolls was my teacher, and Uspensky gave him certain instructions about what he was looking for, um, and he wanted him to make 
contact with a tradition which he felt had always sort of lain, lain behind the different mystical traditions. And in 1962, Dr. Rolls made contact with what was known as the Advaita tradition in India. And Advaita is an Indian term which we'll be ex exploring later, but it really literally translates as not to, and it is tra also translated as, as non-dualism. So Dr. Rolls made contact with the Advaita tradition and in India they have, um, it's a bit like the sort of Archbishop of Canterbury, you have what's known as Shankaracharya, and you have one for the north and one for the south, and one for the east and one for the west. And Dr. Earls and some of his friends used to go out to regular audiences with the Shankaracharya of the north, and to learn more about the non-dual Advaita tradition. And that was in 1961. Then Uspensky had always been interested in the Mevlevi dervishes from Turkey and he writes about them in some of his books. And in, to sort of cut a long story short, in 1963 one of the members of this society had a Turkish boy working on her farm and the Turkish boy's uncle was in the Meblevi tradition in Turkey. And back in the 1920s, Kemal Ataturk, the then ruler of Turkey, had banned all dervish orders and all fortune tellers. And everything that he thought was holding Turkey back from being a modern Western nation. So all the poor dervishes at that point had to go underground. You could go to prison if you turned in public in Turkey in those days. And in the late 1950s, it started to be allowed again as a tourist attraction. Um, and that was quite nice for Meblevi because at least some of them could start to turn again in big ceremonies. But they were also worried that it was gradually bits of it were being changed, bits of the ceremony were being cut out, um, different coloured robes were being worn, and it was being done mainly as a tourist attraction. So we had some members, because of this Turkish boy who came over, and um, some of our people went over to a ceremony in Konya in 1962. And they caught the eye of a sheikh who was presiding at the ceremony. He was a man known as Rezui Bekara. And after the ceremony, they went and talked to him. And they asked him, would it be possible for him to come over to London and to teach the Mevlevi turning ceremony? And he went to his sheikh, who was a man called Munir Chelebi. And Achelebi is a direct descendant of Jalaluddin Rumi, who founded the Mevlevi order back in the 13th century. And Muni Achelebi said, yes, you must go. So Mr. Ezui came over in 1963. He worked as a civil servant, so he could only have four weeks holiday. And during that four weeks, he came over here and he trained 60 turners and they all had to make the robes and because no one here had ever seen the ceremony except the two or three people who had been over and they all had to learn all the prayers and by the end of his four weeks he did a demonstration of the best people he trained all turning and so the Mevlevi turning was then set up here in, in Collet House in London and he asked us to keep it exactly as he taught it because in Turkey they were worried about the changes that were being made and the different postures which were coming in he wanted somewhere that would preserve it as it had been taught for the last 700 years in Turkey so it could be preserved so we made a promise to him to keep it exactly as, as he taught it and the training you're doing, some of you, again, is exactly 
as he taught it. So it's very traditional. And as it goes on, you'll see why you're doing what you're doing. You'll see the purpose of the different parts of it. And so that was, that's almost 50 years ago. And we've carried it on practicing it and training new people each year ever since then. And back in Uspensky's days, this society, Collet House, was what was known as an esoteric school. And it was a bit um, grim and it was quite disciplined and a bit fearsome. Um, and I don't think there was that much happiness. It was quite, quite a severe discipline. And during Dr. Rolls's sort of reign, he totally changed that. And just before he died, he said that he wanted to call it House of the Future to be a cell of self-knowledge, a place that young people particularly could come to get rest and refreshment. But it was a totally open society. There's no rules, no rigidity, but just a friendly society that people can come to make use of the different methods on offer to get rest and refreshment. And with the Mev Levy in particular, it's always, even in Rumi's day, people from all different religions and traditions came along. Um, some of them turned, some of them just were part of the group. And it's the same here. Lots of you come from different traditions. Some of you are Buddhists, some Hindu, some Muslim, some nothing at all. It's everyone's welcome within within the Mevlevi. So you can take what is of value for yourself out of it back into your into your own lives and your own traditions. So in no way does what we share here will affect your own teachings or your own systems. Just take what's what's useful for you and what makes sense to you. So that sort of Dr. Earls died in 1982 and since then we've really been carrying on and developing both Collet House and the Dervishes in the way that he wanted it as an open place which is a sort of, me it's a sort of meeting point for different traditions. Um, and underneath each tradition it's all always the same message which we'll talk about in a minute. So that's really where we're at now, is just this open society which has these different methods which are available for people who really want them. With the actual turning training, this year a lot of people applied and partly because of space we couldn't accept everyone. So we put some on, on the waiting list for, for next year. and. So you, you who, who are here on the train and are those who we accepted. And in a way it was, we know the training and we know this place. So we were trying to see um, who we felt we would suit and also that you would suit us, that we, we were both right for each other in what was being offered. So have anyone got any questions about that? of a basic history. Okay, questions will arise at different times. Later on, in a few weeks, I won't be able to shut you up. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Um, <coughs> I'm going to sort of jump right in at the beginning, in a way. All through history, it's sort of like there's this great underground river that goes down through humanity. And it's almost like there's a great underground ocean, and there's all these different wells that go down into the great ocean. So you have a, a Zen Buddhist well, and a Chinese well, and an Advaita well and a Sufi well, and a Jewish well, and a Christian well, and a Taoist well. And there are so many different wells. 
And when you go down a particular well, whether it's Sufi or Zen Buddhist or whatever, when you get to the bottom and you realize the great ocean, then you understand the metaphors used in all the other wells, because each well has a different set of metaphors. And in a sense, each individual person is like a well, because your particular life is your own route to the realization of your true nature, of your true identity. It's almost like your particular life is an individually devised course of yoga, which is devised just for you. So, uh, I think there's a bit that Joseph Campbell said where he said, if you enter the forest and you find a path, then it's someone else's path. So it's almost like you're finding your own route, you're creating your own route through the forest. So, it's like all through history there's this underlying teaching which keeps bubbling up in different places and the Vova metaphors that are used in each tradition are different. The underlying teaching is essentially identical. It's amazing if you look at different scriptures from the different traditions. It's always the identical experience. It's, it is like it's the same thing just keeps bubbling up. But it, always bubbles up in different forms and it normally bubbles up in a way that is appropriate for the times so um, in the 13th century 13th century metaphors were used and in the 9th century 9th century metaphors were used and now in the 21st century we tend to use 21st century metaphors but always the teaching is essentially the same and the name which is normally given to the teaching is, as I've mentioned, is non-dualism. And as I said, in India it's referred to as Advaita, which means not to. And non-dualism has one pitfall, um, which you probably all know about, is that you can't really explain it rationally. It's beyond the capacity of a rational intellect to understand it. So it's really a, a model of direct experience. But there are various metaphors and there are various pointers and within these talks we'll use various different metaphors from different traditions that are useful. But at the end of the day none of the metaphors matter, it's all a matter of direct realization and direct experience. Any questions or comments on that? You wouldn't have to call it a pitfall. Sorry? You wouldn't have to call it a pitfall. A pitfall, no, okay. <coughs> no, it's not really a pitfall, you're right. Probably it's a pretty blessing. Yeah. Okay, I'll try using some metaphors just again to to start um, explaining it and expanding on it. There's a very nice metaphor that Rumi uses about how um, the creator of the one mind, um, just being the one un undifferentiated, undifferentiated consciousness. Um, can get a bit boring, so it wants to manifest itself as a as a creation in time and space. And Rumi uses the example of the the one mind, the universal consciousness, playing backgammon with itself. And if you're the one mind and you you're playing backgammon, and you've got the board in front of you, and then you you need an opponent on the other side. So the one mind makes its move. And then it has to run round to the other side of the board to make the opposing move. But as it's the same being playing both sides, there's not much of a game. So when you go, it goes round the other side of the board, it has to make the move in forgetfulness of who it really is. 
and then so it makes its move, forgetting who it is, and then it comes back round to this side of the board and makes its move, and so the game continues. So using that metaphor, all of us are the one mind playing the great game of life or dancing the dance of creation but in forgetfulness of who we really are because all of us really are the one mind but in order for there to be a creation of, of multiplicity there's this forgetfulness of who we really are so we appear to be separate people reacting with other separate people and that gives rise to the whole drama and dance of creation. I was actually thinking that, you know, dualism, non-dualism is like opposite of dualism, you see what I mean? But I think they are completely different because non-dualism is you know, like in in nature, there is if there is ugly, there is beautiful. If there is bad, there is good. You know, this is non-dualism, isn't it? That's dualism. Oh, is that? <laughs> 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 and uh, so, if it is dualism, I was thinking non-dualism is like there is no good. Everything is the same. Is that so? At one level, yeah. Within, from the point of view of his teaching and the metaphors we're using, within the drama of the one mind, the one consciousness, whatever you want to use for that, plays all the different roles in the drama. So it plays both the villain and the good person, which are both relative terms at the end of the day. So, I'm just trying to remember a quotation from Rezui Bekara. He said, the things that appear opposite in this world of manifestation are nothing but the coming face to face of the variable qualities of God. So, within the, the one mind manifests as a drama in time and space, and from our perspective, all these different things appear as opposites. And so we have good and, good and evil and everything else. But from another perspective, it's all seen as the manifestation of the oneness. Oh, so is it the same thing? It's the same thing. So it's like, um, there's a Buddhist sage called Nagarjuna who used the phrase, um, Nirvana and Samsara are the same. So at the end of the day, there's no difference between the world of manifestation and the great underlying stillness. But we'll get on to that later. Because that's what the whole turning ceremony is a symbol of that one thing. With non dualism, I was going to explain it all in one word, one one sentence. And the one sentence would be everything is consciousness, everything is the dance. So if you get that, and you're okay with that, you can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> everything is consciousness, everything is the dance. Now if you want it in two, two sentences, I put, you are not just your body or your psychological processes, you are the awareness stillness or presence that lies behind them. Noticing that is stage one. Stage two is noticing that the whole universe exists within this still presence that is yourself. So those two phrases for me sum up the whole teaching. Everything is consciousness, everything is the dance. And I'm going to keep coming back to these over the weeks. You are not just your body or your psychological processes. You are the awareness, stillness or presence that lies behind them. Noticing that is stage one. 
Stage two is noticing that the whole universe exists within this still presence that is yourself. So don't try and analyse that, just sort of hold it in the back of your mind somewhere. And then going on from that, there was two verses from different traditions and different times, which again I thought summed up the whole of the teaching. And the first one's from a, a poet, I think he's Persian, called Nizamoglu, from the 16th century. I probably haven't pronounced that right. And I'll read you what he wrote. I cannot say who it is I am. I am amazed. I am amazed. I cannot call this self myself. I am amazed. I am amazed. Who is in my eyes seeing? Who is in my heart enduring? Who is inhaling and exhaling? I am amazed. I am amazed. Who is speaking with my tongue? Who is listening with my ears? Who is understanding with my mind? I am amazed, I am amazed. Who is stepping with these feet? Who is tasting with my mouth? Who is chewing and who swallowing? I am amazed, I am amazed. Who holds these riches in my hand? Who is the one throwing them away? Who is buying and who is selling? I am amazed, I am amazed. Why is there life coursing below my skin? Why are my eyes bloodshot from crying? Why this religion? Why this faith? I am amazed, I am amazed. O Sayyid Nizamoglu, hear this. Everything comes from the One. Abandon yourself to this mighty beauty. I am amazed, I am amazed. That was from the 16th century. It's very beautiful. It is very beautiful. Well, yeah. It really sums it up, I think. And just from another tradition, here's a second one. And this is from an Indian saint called Padmasambhava, who introduced Buddhism into Tibet in the 8th century, where he's commonly known as Guru Rinpoche. This self-originated clear light, eternally unborn, is a parentless babe of wisdom. Wondrous is this. Being non-created, it is natural wisdom. Wondrous is this. Not having known birth, it knows not death. Wondrous is this. Although it is total reality, there is no perceiver of it. Wondrous is this. Although wandering in the sangsara, it remains undefiled by evil. Wondrous is this. Although seeing the Buddha, it remains unallied to good. Wondrous is this. Although possessed by all beings, it is not recognized. Wondrous is this. Those not knowing the fruit of this yoga seek other fruit. Wondrous is this. Although the clear light of reality shines within one's own mind, the multitude look for it elsewhere. Wondrous is this. That's pretty wondrous. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's hard to know how to follow that. I'm going to carry on with another metaphor and in Rumi's tradition Rumi wrote this epic poem called the Matnavi which I'm told just sort of flowed out of him he also spontaneously went into the turning movement which was <coughs> later formalised by his family into the ceremony which you're, some of you are learning at the moment and in the Matanavi there's a lovely little Rumi story which for me sums up the process of manifestation and each person's journey through life and the paradoxical nature of it. 
Um, so it's about the story is about a man who lived in Baghdad, and he kept having this recurring dream that there was this great treasure hidden in a particular house in Cairo. So he dreamt about it so often, but eventually he decided to set off to Cairo. And on the way there, he had all sorts of adventures. And when eventually he got there, he met a man on the street, and he told the man about his dream. And the man from Cairo said, well, that's a bit of a coincidence, because I've had this recurring dream that there's this great treasure in this particular house in Baghdad. And he described it, and the man from Baghdad recognized that it was his own house that was being described. So he went back home and dug in the cellar, and sure enough, there was the great treasure. So what that story for me says is that although we all already are the one consciousness, we already are the thing we're seeking, it's like you have to go on this great journey of manifestation and life and you have all these adventures and all these dramas and some of them are traumatic and some of them are blissful and in a strange roundabout way you come back again to the beginning to rediscover that what you were looking for, what you were searching for was all the time in your own house. More than that it was who, who you actually are. So that metaphor, that's one of my very favourite stories and metaphors. And again, when you come to do the, the ceremony, the turning ceremony, the whole of the ceremony is an illustration of that point. Apparently, um, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi said that what you're looking for is where you're looking from. That's very nice. Yeah. Well done, St. Francis. <laughs> <laughs> With here, I've done a sort of metaphorical, again, version of, of that journey. And you have to sort of imagine it as a circle, which is a circle of... When the dervishes turn, they turn on a circular floor, which is known as a, a semahani. And the first part of the circle, the shape normally sits there, and the first part of the circle is the outflowing from one into many. So it's like the one mind manifesting as a creation in time and space. In Taoism they say the one mind becomes a 10,000 thing. And then at a certain point it's what's known as a return to source. The, the many returns back into the oneness. So it's like a sort of out-breath and an in-breath. In Buddhism, they call that wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is the use of a discriminative mind to return back to its source. And then compassion is the outflowing, is the realization that you and everyone else are not separate. So it's the outflowing back into the many. So it's like this continual two-way flow going on. In this diagram, what I've done here, excuse my diagram I've done a sort of the different stages that you go through within this circular journey and when you're before birth when you're in the womb it's like a non-dual state there's no separation there's no other there's just oneness and I've referred to that as I am everything and I've put the pre-rational unity of a baby. When you're born into the world, I'm told um, by psychologists that the newborn baby still doesn't differentiate itself between itself and those around it. So its siblings and its parents and everything else is all seen as an extension of itself. At a certain point, you gradually start to learn that your brothers and sisters are separate. You, you're told that you've got a name and you start to separate yourself off from your parents and from the world around. So it's like separation is superimposed on top of the unity. And that's very necessary because otherwise you wouldn't, there'd be no drama of life. 
and you wouldn't be able to relate to other people um, within the drama. So you need to develop this healthy sense of of being a separate ego, of being a separate person. And I refer to that as I am something. So I am everything at a certain point gradually merges in, becomes I am something is superimposed on top of it. The big downside of being an I am something is that you then enter a world of both pleasure and pain. So when the life goes in a way that appeals to you, then you feel happy. Because there's separate others out there, when it goes in a way that doesn't appeal to you, then you become unhappy. So it's like there's this cycle, you then enter a cycle of pleasure and pain. In the background, there's still a memory of the unified state. And that memory of the unified state drives all your ambitions in life. So you know, you've got this dim memory of of this state of total unity. And you visit it, you visit it every night when you go into deep sleep. And there's no trauma, there's no experience, it's just total stillness. So it's like driving your ambitions is this distant memory. And Rumi, again, in the turning ceremony, he uses the analogy of the ney flute, that's that flute which is played in the ceremony, and how it's longing for its origins, it's longing for the reed bed. So within the dervish ceremony, that metaphor is very strong. The idea that ultimately everyone is trying to seek this basic state of unity. So that goes on and normally at a certain point the pleasure and pain cycle becomes a bit tiresome. So you start looking for something and at first normally you have all these different life ambitions. So you think if I had a really big house and a really nice partner and everything else I'd be really happy and this longing would go away. And when you get your ambition, if you do, normally for a little while the longing does go away, but then quite rapidly the longing for something missing returns. So you sort of realise you've projected it onto something. So that goes on until you exhaust the search in the outer world. So that's the search in external things. And then you think, I've looked outside, it must be inside. So you learn various techniques of yoga and meditation and everything else. And often when you first try and look behind your psyche, it comes as a great shock, because it's almost like there's nothing there. You thought you were this sort of very sort of solid person with memories and thoughts, but when you examine it very closely, it's like lying just behind your psyche, lying behind your eyes, is this great ocean of emptiness. In Buddhism they often use the analogy of the sky. And the reason it appears like that is because, as Padmasambhava said in that quote, there's no observer of it. There's nothing that can look back and see it because it itself is the observer. Anything you can observe has a beginning and an end in time and space. So any object you can see, any experience even, has a beginning and an end. Whereas that which observes, that which is the seer or the witness, has no boundaries, because there's no observer of it, it is the observer. So I've called that stage, I am nothing. And it also has other names like beingness, presence, consciousness. And it's just like when you're very young, when you're five, there's this sense of something looking out through your eyes that never changes. And when you're 55, that thing is exactly the same, still looking out through your eyes and never changing. The I am something 
your mind-body mechanism is changing all the time. It's like thoughts and desires and feelings and emotions are arising within this space that is yourself and then they just depart again. Whereas the space, the great sky, the great stillness is totally unaffected by what arises and falls within it. At this stage, it's almost like you're the great stillness and you're looking out on an external world. So you're looking out, you're observing the world from a point of view of stillness. What happens next is you notice something or something is noticed and that is that everything you're observing, all sense perceptions, all experiences, even distant sounds, even when you look at distant galaxies through a telescope, it's all happening and all being experienced within this space that is yourself. And at that point there ceases, you cease to experience the world as separate. You see the world as taking place within this consciousness with, that is yourself. So from this point of view it's like the whole universe exists within you and that's again a return to the I am everything but it's not the pre-rational unity that the baby had with this experience of unity it's fully empathetic so it's like it takes into account everyone else so that again is the Buddhist compassion so that's like the circular journey because <coughs> All it is on one level is you are the great stillness, you are the one consciousness and as life goes on things are imposed on top of it so you get a building up of different identities like I am a man or I am a woman and then you have all these different things that interest you and then you have a profession, I am a doctor or I am an artist and that goes on and on building and at a certain point like everything, all those identities start dropping away again and often when people are made redundant it seems like a great calamity because you've identified with this identity in time of whatever you are and then it falls away and at first it feels like a little death and then you suddenly realise that it's not really a death, it's like an opening up into what you really are that lies that identity that underpins everything and lies beneath everything. So that's really Rumi's circular story of the man from Baghdad. Because all the time, who you are is looking out through your eyes. Consciousness, the great beingness, the one mind, is looking out through your eyes. It's talking at the moment in my case, and it's listening in your case. So that's the circular journey, and that's the dance of creation and that's the cosmic dance and that's what we'll be developing over the next few weeks so if you want to say anything say it if not I'll end it there because that's probably enough to one night can I ask with the, with the actual physical turning and um, with the turning of anticlockwise um, is it is it the male returning into the female, the masculine returning into the feminine? Do you understand what I mean? I understand what you mean within the physical practice. I think that just in the turning, Helen will add to this, it just really mirrors the way the planets turn. Mm. And you're also, in the turning we have this phrase called looking into your heart, which you'll, you'll hear more and more. And looking into your heart initially is having an awareness of your still centre. So it's this. And then after a while you discover, as Rumi says, the heart isn't inside you, everything is inside the heart, which is this. So when you turn, as we turn anti-clockwise, you're sort of turning in, into your heart, as it were. And again, you had the symbolism of, of this turn, which is the outflow, and then the return 
of many back into oneness. In reality, you, you never leave the oneness. It only appears like it. So in, in Buddhism, they say no one actually becomes a Buddha. You just simply cease to be deluded. Yeah, you want to say something about the soul? Um, yes, I'll probably read something about the soul later on. A very nice story about the soul, but I'm saving it. Um, it cleans. And also, um, because I have another story to read you very soon, and it's um, when you're learning to turn your effectively known as chick, affectionately known as chickpeas. So you'll get used to being called a chickpea, and um, it's it's the process. You're being cooked. We ha it's a very nice story of um, so this process of you always add salt to cooking to give it flavour. Mm. So you're being cooked, and on a practical level, I can see what your feet are doing because they make pattern and we're aiming to get a circle in the salt and your foot you leave footprints so I can see exactly what you are doing or not doing. So I have a very visual picture. <laughs> Thank you. And also it's um, it's a purification process and salt cleans. So if you're on the training, we're meeting again tomorrow, eh? <coughs> and make sure you put some good plasters on your toes. <laughs> I saw one or two coming off today, you've really got to wrap them around. Yeah. Mine used to come off every week, every lesson I think mine came off. My plaster was over the board. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, what's happening next Tuesday? Do we have... Uh, Helen, I... <coughs> so every Thursday your lessons are followed by Cosmic Dance. On Tuesday and Fridays, t Tuesday you can... Um, it's the, the timings will be kept the same for now. So Tuesdays and Fridays, exactly the same as Thursday. But we've only got one Tuesday class before next you start. Week, okay. Yeah, Tuesday and Thursday next week, same time. Um, but there's no cosmic dance, so you can, if you're in group one next week, it means you can actually slow turn upstairs with the turners at eight o'clock if you want to, if you haven't had enough, if you haven't been finished off. Um, group two obviously will be with me. Um, yeah, does that explain it? And if you're not on the training and you just want to come to more cosmic <laughs> dance, it's exactly the same time next week. It doesn't always run exactly according to time because the turners have to have their food. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please try to...